Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to cover uh, generalized linear models. In particular, one very special um, case of that, which is often called logistic regression or the logit, uh, the logit link function. Okay, so that's the most commonly used case. Okay, so to get started with this idea of logistic regression, which is one instance of generalized linear models we are going to look at a relatively famous data set in statistics. This is called the Beetle data set from the Dobson et al. textbook that I had mentioned to you. This is the Introduction to Generalized Linear Models textbook. Now, you're not required to read it, but I'm just mentioning the source of this data set. The data set shows you the number of beetles that are killed when they are exposed to different doses of some um, toxic chemical that's used to kill beetles okay so you have different levels of dose here and you have the number of beetles exposed and the number that's killed right so if you just plot this right so oh well we'll just plot, plot this in a second but the question is the research question is whether uh, increasing the dose affects the probability of killing the insects right so that's uh, that's a plausible research question here and so uh, in this kind of problem. So the first thing we want to do in this situation is that we want to, uh, in order to plot the data, one useful thing to do would be to calculate the proportions, right? So what you can do is you can create a new column called proportion dead. That's this column here, right? Um, and the way you would do it is you take the number of beetles killed divided by the number of beetles exposed row wise, you know? So you will compute 6 over 6 over 59 here and then 13 over um, 60 etc this gives you the proportion killed and that's what that column is so this is 0 0.10 0 0.21 you can see the numbers going up as the dose is increased okay so so now we are ready to plot the results and so what you have on the x axis is the dose and on the y-axis is the proportion uh, that is dying, right? So notice that the proportion dead has to range between 0 and 1 because it's a probability, right? It cannot be bigger than 1. And so that's why you see this characteristic S-shape. This, this characteristic S-shape because what's happening is that as you go towards 0 or you go towards 1, Used the proportions will start flattening out, and so you will never have a situation that this line just keeps growing and growing because probability is a, is a absolute cutoff here. You can't go beyond one, right? Similarly, you can't go beyond beyond zero. Therefore, you can't go in a straight line like this. That's why you get this characteristic shape, you know, that is bounded between zero and one. So uh, now. We could do something crazy here, you know. So let me see if I can erase all this. Uh, let me erase all this stuff that I've done. And one thing I could do, just looking at this plot here, one naive thing that I could start with, and it's always good to actually play around, as I've said before. It's good to play around with naive things to get a feeling for what will have, what can go wrong, you know, if you do this. So that's an example here of. Uh, doing crazy stuff. Okay, so like if I fit a linear model, I should get roughly a fit like this. What's wrong with that? Okay. So let's find out. So I fit a linear model here, right? And I've got proportion dead on the as a dependent variable, and I've got centered dose as my predictor. Um, and if you if you remember, I've discussed centering before, why centering is important. So whenever possible, I generally will be centering my predictors. Okay. So if I center my predictors and fit this model, what I get is an intercept which tells me the proportion, the expected proportion that uh, would die for a centered dose of zero that means for the average dose level so, so the probability of death will be about 60 percent with the average dose level okay and for every unit increase 
of dose okay the expected increase in the probability is 0 0.6 is the intercept right the for every unit increase in dose the expected increase in probability of death is 5.3 right so if if i increase the dose by one unit beyond the average the probability of death is going to be 5.90 right is that a reasonable probability do you think does that probability make sense obviously it doesn't right so the probability can only range from 0 to 1 and suddenly by fitting this linear model we find out how crazy things can get right uh, when you start using the wrong um, likelihood here when trying to study this problem you can end up in some weird situations right so the model looks fine you know if you plot the linear model everything looks good but the interpretation of the coefficients is quite weird here okay so that's why i don't want to use a linear model when talking about proportions when i'm talking about a zero one response or talking about the number of successes given a certain number of you know counts <coughs> as in this particular case okay so in, what's the alternative the alternative is to use the appropriate uh, model and so in this case the appropriate model instead of the linear model would be one where we transform the dependent variable that is the proportion p of uh, dead beetles we transform that and then model the transformation as a function of dose. So what transformation shall we use? We are going to use the odds, uh, odds transform. That means, well, odds is defined as the proportion of successes divided by the proportion of failures. Okay, so that's what an odds is defined as. And what we will do is we will take the log of that. And so we will be modeling the log of odds. So we are transforming proportions to log odds and we're going to model we're going to model log odds uh, as a function of dose okay so we're going to fit a linear model now we're actually going to fit a linear model but on transformed data remember when we fit models to reading times we sometimes log transform the data right it's a similar situation here we're transforming the proportions to log odds and then fitting a linear model to that right so this kind of model is called a logistic regression model <coughs> i'll explain in a moment what that is by the way i don't have coronavirus got an allergy it's causing this coughing so don't panic so um what we have here is that we're going to fit this model with log odds i'm going to show you how to do that and what we will do then is that once we've estimated the parameters beta 0 and beta 1 in what we'll call log odds space we're going to transform it back to probability space to get back an interpretation for our model fit in terms that we as human beings can understand okay so how would we do that well suppose i fit a model like equation three here right i've computed my log odds uh, estimates the estimates beta zero and beta one using whatever methods right um, in the past we had used least squares right to do all that matrix algebra to compute the estimates of beta 0 beta 1 in this particular type of model we use a slightly different method called iteratively reweighted least squares something like that right so the actual model fitting method is not something i will discuss but i just want to say that we estimate the parameters beta 0 and beta 1 somehow and now we can once we have estimated these these parameters beta 0 and beta 1 we know what the dose is because that's part of the data we can now figure out the uh, probabilities for every dose level okay so how do i do that so first of all consider this equation here okay so i've got log odds here if i want to move back to probability space i need to first get rid of the logs so one way to get rid of the log is to exponentiate both sides okay so now what i have is the exponent of the log odds that gives me back the odds right so this will give me this is going to give me p over 1 minus p and on the right hand side i'm going to get the exponent of beta 0 plus beta 1 times those right those can be 
whatever number is in the data frame, right? So, so once we have this equation, all we have to do is solve for p, and then when we do that, we get this term, this equation here. So let me just do this this calculation for you, okay? So the equation I had on the previous page was p over one minus p, and that's equal to what did I say? Exponent of beta zero plus beta one. I'll just call this those here, right? So those. Okay, so now I have to, the task is to solve for the proportion p as a function of whatever else I have on the right hand side. Okay, so let's do that. So first I'm going to multiply both sides with 1 minus p. So I get p is equal to 1 minus p times exponent of so this thing is a very long term and it's never going to change. I'm just going to keep moving it around. So I'll just call this mu hat, okay? I'm just going to call this term mu hat just to make it shorter for myself, okay? All right. So now what do I do? So now I've got a term 1 minus p multiplied with exponent of mu hat. So let me unpack this right-hand side. So I get exponent of mu hat minus p times exponent of mu hat, right? So I've just unpacked that product there. And so now as what I want is p on one side of the equation and everything else on the right-hand side. So I'm going to add to both sides of the equation um, p exponent mu hat, right? If I do that, this term will disappear, okay? So I will end up with exponent mu hat on this side, okay? All right, so now it look, it's looking pretty easy because I have p as a common term and I've got one plus exponent mu hat is equal to exponent mu hat. And so the very last step that I will take now is that p is going to be equal to, I divide both sides by, sorry, there's a bracket missing here. I divide both sides by 1 plus exponent mu hat, and what do I get? I get exponent mu hat divided by 1 plus exponent mu hat, right? So, this is how I went from this statement to stating my probabilities in terms of the right hand side of the log odds model that I had estimated. Okay, so that's how I got equation five. This is equation five. Okay. All right. So what this means is that once I fit the model on log in log odds space, I can back transform using the uh, equation five that I have here. I can back transform to expected probability of uh, success, or in this case, the probability of death. Uh, as a function of dose, right? You plug in different values of dose, you will get some, when you plug in different values of dose, you'll get some proportion as a consequence, okay? So we will do this, we'll see how this works. So now for a practical example, okay? So let's go back to the beetle data. So we're going to fit the model using the GLM function. Instead of LM, we are going to use the generalized linear model, that's GLM, and we're going to say this special term here in the mod, in the GLM function is we're going to state that we have binomial data, so successes and failures, and um, we are going to fit the so-called logit function. Okay, so I've been calling it logistic regression now. Suddenly, I'm calling it logit. I will explain in a moment what all these terms are. Okay, but my dependent variable is the proportion dead, and my predictor is those. And I've got this term here called weights, which is telling me the total count uh, for each of those calculations of proportion dead. Okay, that, that's what those weights are telling me. And my data is the beetle data set. So I'm saving that as the object fm1. So we can operate with the object fm1 now to do all our back transformations that I was talking about. Okay, so here's the model fit. Here's the model. So what this model gives us this is very small text. So I have to take off my glasses. So what uh, what this is doing is it's printing out the first line is printing out the GLM formula that we gave to compute all the um, uh, estimates right 
and then what we get is the beta 0 and beta 1 estimates here along with their standard errors and these are in log all space okay and then you get your usual statistical tests but we ignore that right now we are more interested in the modeling at the moment right and so uh, the rest of the output here um, this null deviance and residual deviance is telling you about the quality of the model fit and also doing an implicit model comparison for you so I'm going to explain all that in a moment but I'm just showing you what the output of the GLM function is okay it gives you all the information that you need this number of Fisher uh, scoring iterations is telling you how the mo the model how how many iterations it took to estimate the parameter so basically what's happening is that the <coughs> remember that in the simple linear model the way we do estimation is by using uh, the least squares method right so we had we were trying to find so we had this x beta if you remember the uh, remember the um, the matrix formulation of the linear models right so I had my y vector and I had my um, x beta hat vector and this was the epsilon right this is the difference between the y and the x beta hat vector and I'm trying to find the minimum distance between the y and the x beta hat I'm trying to find the beta hat such that I have a minimum distance between y and x beta hat right that is called the least squares method the generalized linear me model uh, framework here is using something something called iteratively reweighted least squares to calculate the beta hat parameters and that's this uh, number of Fisher, Fisher scoring iterations is telling you the number of steps that the iteration pr procedure takes to get the estimate stable estimates of the coefficients okay the details of the estimation procedure are actually not interesting for us in this course because that's really statistical details you need to get into too much math you know to understand those and it's not really very useful in practical terms for for us as users of statistics okay all we need to know is that there is some estimation procedure that is being used that is different from the estimation procedure being used in the linear model okay all right so once we have the dose on the x-axis right and uh, we can and we also have the proportion dead from the data right so those are the circles we can actually plot on top of the observed data which is the circles we can plot the fitted values and you can see that the x's which are the fitted values are a pretty good fit to the observed data okay so it's a reasonable model if you look at it right so once we've estimated uh, these uh, parameters the beta 0 and beta 1 on the log odd scale we can do a lot of interesting things with this now right so one is of course that we could um, we could plot the fitted values right i've shown you here those values here but another thing you can do is we can compute the log odds of death for uh, different concentrations right so for different doses right so this is one possible dose that you might have so for this dose if i want to know what's the what is my predicted uh, probability of death and what is my uncertainty about that estimate so what I really want is some probability p hat of death for the dose 1.7552 and I also want a 95% confidence interval right so a lower bound and an upper bound that describes my uncertainty about that estimate for that dose that the that I would expose the beetles to so this is basically using the model to predict the probability of death right you can think of this as a very practical question that you might have okay if i have this dose of this chemical right of this pesticide let's say uh, what is the probability that i will kill uh, the beetles and what's my uncertainty about that probability it's a very useful quantity to have right all right so the way i would do this is that i would actually use matrix algebra the matrix formulation that i had shown you earlier but you could do this in a non matrix way as well right so basically what i have is i've got a beta 0 and beta 1 estimate so i'm going to apply the dose 
sorry, what is it? 1.7. So I'm sorry, I missed wrote this. I'm going to multiply beta 1 with 1.7552. And beta over 0 is of course multiplied with 1. So I just leave it there. And so what I get is an expected um, log odds of death for that particular dose is beta 0 plus beta 1 times. Oh, I just, I'm just rewriting what I just wrote. I'm sorry. It's not very useful actually. So let's see if we do this. Right, so what I'm doing here is exactly the same calculation but in matrix terms, right? So let's say I define a matrix with a 1.7552, right? So this is a 1 by 2 matrix and I've got my uh, beta parameters as beta 0 and beta 1 estimates, right? They should be beta hat. I'm sorry about that. They should all be beta hat because they're estimates. And so now if I do this matrix calculation, what's going to happen? I'm going to get 1 times beta 0 hat plus uh, beta 0 hat times 1.7552, which is exactly what I calculated here. So basically, this is what I'm doing in matrix terms. I'm computing the log odds of death using a matrix calculation. That's what this matrix calculation is doing. It's taking the the transform of x. So x here is actually, if I print this out, and you should try and print it out, right, you'll get a 2 by 1 matrix. Right? So what I'm doing is I'm transforming this to a 1 by 2 matrix. Okay, So that's what's happening here. Then I'm multiplying that. This is the matrix multiplicator with the coefficients of the fitted model. So that's what the coef of fm1 is doing here, right? this one here. So once I do this calculation, I get a single number, right, which is minus 0.56618. That is the log odds of death. Now, as an ordinary human being, I have no idea what log odds of minus 0.56618 is. I want to know the number and probabilities, right? So I'm going to back transform this, okay? All right, so but before I do that, I also want some way to calculate the confidence interval of the probability of death for this particular dose and the, for that I need actually the the standard error of the intercept as well as the slope because you can see that for the calculation of the mean both the intercept and the slope are needed right you can't calculate the pro, the log odds of death this minus 0.56618 without the intercept and the slope. So if you want to calculate the uncertainty of that estimate, you also need the uncertainty of the intercept and slope. So where is the uncertainty of the intercept and the slope? It's in the variance covariance matrix of the fitted model. So if you recall the matrix formulation of the linear model lecture, you will see that there is the variance covariance matrix that gives you, in this case, it gives you a 2 by 2 matrix, <coughs> which contains the sigma squared, so the standard error squared of the sampling distribution of beta 0. This is so difficult to write because there's so much, so many subscripts. So let me just rewrite this. I'm going to call the, the standard, oops, sorry. I'm going to call the standard error of the beta 0 estimate, right? I'm going to call this sigma 0 squared and I'm call, going to call the standard error of the slope sigma 1, uh, sigma 1. So the variance would be sigma 1 squared. So the variance covariance matrix here actually contains the correlation times sigma 0, sigma 1, correlation times sigma 0, sigma 1. Okay. So this VCOV, VCOV function takes as input the model fm1 and it returns a 2 by 2 matrix which contains these variances and, and covariances. This, this remember, this is the covariance of the two uh, in, of the intercept and the slope estimate. Okay. All right. So what I'm doing here now is that I'm going to use this variance covariance matrix which tells me the intercept variance, the slope variance. Okay and the correlation between them. That's inside the variance covariance matrix, right? So I'm going to use these three pieces of information to compute the uncertainty of 
my probability estimate of the probability of death for the particular dose that I'm looking at, that is 1.7552 or whatever it was that I was computing, right? So that's that. That's inside this matrix X. Remember my matrix X is something like 1.17552, right? So, so that's, uh, is that correct? Yeah. Right, so this the this is the this matrix is my transformed matrix T, right? This one here. So this is supposed to be a bracket. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so here we go. Right, so we have the this matrix T of X, this one here, right? And we're going to it's a one by two matrix, and we're going to multiply it with a two by two matrix. That is the variance covariance matrix, and then we are also going to multiply it again with uh, x which is 1 1.7552 so what am i doing here this looks so obscure okay so let me show you what's going on so let's see can i open my sorry my one note is missing here <coughs> sorry okay so what's going on here is that you might remember from several lectures ago when I was doing the, the matrix formulation of the linear model, I, I mentioned that if you have, uh, let's say you want to, you, you know the variance of the beta hats, okay? That's what the variance covariance matrix is, right? That's the variance of the beta hat. Now, if you, if you multiply if you want to know what the variance is of the beta hat multiplied with um, 1 times x, so some constant, okay, some constant which I'll call a. So if I want to know what the variance is of a times beta hat, right? Remember that uh, several lectures ago I told you that the there is a result in statistics which states that the variance of a random variable like beta hat multiplied by some constant a which in our case is the in our case is this uh, this matrix 2 by 1 matrix sorry sorry 2 by uh, 1 matrix 1x right where x is the dose so let me just write this accurately oh, this is not nice actually let me redo this. Uh, this is getting so ugly. Okay, so right. So what I'm talking about here is that I, I want to say that I know what the variance of beta hat is. That's the weak of matrix. Sigma zero squared, sigma one squared, rho sigma zero, rho sigma one. Right. That was my variance of um, beta hat. Now there's a result in statistics which says that if you have some random variable x, random variable x, right, it has some variance, right, let's call it, I don't know, sigma squared or something, and if you multiply that random variable x with a constant a, then what is the variance of a times x, right, that's the question. So there's a result in statistics which says that the variance of this particular case is x multiplied with a squared okay that's the key result from statistics that we're going to use but i mean i'm not going to prove this of course so i just want you to take it on trust in the matrix setup right in the matrix framework here the variance of beta hat here is actually a two by two matrix right so we are in the matrix world right now so the matrix equivalent of this is that if i want to know the variance of let's say one times what was my matrix one times 7552 was the dose right this is a 2 by 1 matrix and I'm going to multiply this with the variance covariance matrix sigma 0 squared sigma 1 squared because that's the variance of my beta hats okay so what I'm trying to find out is the variance of the for a, for a particular dose level the variance of my estimators okay so that's and I've got the variance covariance matrix from the fitted model 
and I need to figure this term out now. This is my constant and this is my variance of the estimators beta 0 and beta 1. So I'm going to use this result. I'm going to use this result but in the matrix framework. In the matrix framework, the result states that I can compute this variance by multiplying Right, so I've got a 1 by 2 matrix here. I will have a 2 by 2 matrix here. Sigma 0 squared, sigma 1 squared, rho sigma 0, sigma 1, rho sigma 0, sigma 1. And here I'm going to have a transform version of this constant. Okay, 1, 1.7552. Right. So <clears throat> really what I'm doing here by putting in this term twice is that I'm doing the equivalent of squaring in the matrix world okay so that is why I'm doing this calculation to compute the uncertainty of the estimate for the uh, particular dose that I'm interested in getting the probabilities for okay so all this so I'm sorry for this long digression but all I wanted to show you is that this is what this line of code is doing right it's computing this uh, variance covariance matrix for the particular dose right and it gives you some number can't see it right now it's like 0.21 okay so it gives you a point value why right think about why you get a point value because you've got a 2 by 1 by 2 matrix here you got a 2 by 2 matrix here and a 2 by 1 matrix here if I multiply all these guys out I'm gonna get a 1 by 1 matrix a 1 by 1 matrix is a scalar it's a single number okay and that's gonna give you the variance for that particular dose uh, given those estimates, uh, the variances of the intercept and the slope. Okay, so that's what I've computed the variance of the log odds, right? In the log odds scale, I'm going to convert that back later on to probabilities. Okay, so the how would I do this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to compute my estimated log odds, the mean effect that I had computed, right? I had computed the mean effect. Remember, log odds was computed by whatever beta 0 was and beta 1 multiplied with uh, 1.7552 that was my log odds right so that's my log odds what I'm gonna say is that um, because the this variance that I've just computed is telling me the variance under repeated sampling of my uh, estimators beta 0 and beta 1 for that particular dose if I take the square root of that variance and I <coughs> remember the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that under repeated sampling, the distribution of the means under repeated sampling is approximately normal. Now, a property of the normal distribution is that plus minus two times or 1.96 times. Uh, this is so ugly. Sorry about this. Let me rewrite this properly. Okay. Okay, so remember that in a normal distribution with some mean mu plus minus 1.96 times the standard error will will cover so minus 1.96 times the standard error will cover 95 percent of the area under the curve okay so if I want to compute a 95 percent confidence interval I will and I if I'm willing to take a normal approximation which I am because of the central limit theorem I'm going to compute taking as mean the estimated log odds okay I'm still in log odds space okay by the way that I'm trying to compute the lower and upper bound of the confidence intervals in log odds space so I take the log odds which is whatever this value is that's this thing here and I subtract from it 1.96 times the standard error. So what's the standard error? It's the square root of the variance that I just computed in the previous slide. Okay. So what that gives me in this normal approximation, it gives me this lower bound in log odd space. Okay. So I get the lower bound with, with this equation here, this calculation here. And that's this term here. So minus 0 0.85, <coughs> sorry. 476 okay similarly I can compute the upper bound as by taking the mean estimated mean plus 1.96 times the standard error that gives me the upper bound right that's this computation here 
and that gives me a minus point uh, minus point two seven seven six right so the mean was something like what was my mean it was minus point five six minus point five six right so now I have the lower bound upper bound and the mean in log out space which so what I what this is giving me is the log odds of death for that particular dose that I had set up my what was it 1.7556 right so once I have these three numbers I can now use the transformation that I had calculated earlier to figure out what uh, the probability of death would be plus a 95% confidence interval right for that particular dose level so let's figure out the mean probability of death. We're going to take as input the log odds. Remember what my calculation was. I had done this derivation a few minutes ago. Exponent of mu hat, 1 plus exponent of mu hat, where mu hat is what? Is the beta 0, beta 1 times 1.755 whatever it was right I've forgotten the number already but <coughs> I calculated this number in log odds space I use this equation to calculate the probability and that's my mean probability and it is 0.36 okay similarly instead of using the mean now I can use the lower bound of my confidence interval which I just computed okay so I take the lower bound and I compute the lower probability which is 29% 29.8% and similarly I compute the upper bound using the upper estimate that I just computed this one here right so I get the upper bound of the estimate in probabilities and which is what I don't know 0.43 right so the end result of this long drawn out lecture now I'm sorry for droning on and on about this is that when I have a dose of 1.752, the probability of death based on the model estimates, okay? I'm using the model to estimate future probability of death for a new dose that I might use. is 36% with a 95% confidence interval of 30 and 43%, right? So this is how I would compute the expected probability of death for any arbitrary dose, right? So one thing to notice here is that I, I did not try to predict the probability of death outside the range that I have observed. Okay, this is very important to understand. If you've observed a particular range of dose, right? So what was our actually observed range? Let's take a look at the figure again, right? So the observed range doesn't go beyond two, I think. Or not even that, actually 1.9 or something like that, right? So suppose that once I fit the model for this particular range of 1.6 to 1.9 or something um, and so 1.6 let's say to 1.9 so suppose I now enthusiastically want to know what the probability of death will be for 2.5 okay in log odd space I'm assuming that dose is linearly related to the log odds of death that may not be true okay so I'm just assuming a linear extrapolation in this case to compute the probability the log odds of death for a dose of 2.5 I never observed anything in this range so that is a very dangerous thing to do to try to predict outside the range that you have observed because that presupposes that the model is linear okay so you have to be very careful about prediction Right, so statisticians sometimes say that it's very hard to predict things, especially the future. Okay, so they should also say that it's very hard to predict beyond what you have observed. Okay, so you, it's very, it's it's easy to talk about the weather that you have already observed. Okay, or we want to predict the weather for tomorrow. You might still be able to predict it but if you want to predict the weather accurately for like 10 days ahead or 15 days ahead uh, it's uh, of this actually I'm confusing two different things here but uh, it's not that you can observe the future even in principle so the the important thing I'm trying to get across is that it's what you have you don't know 
is hard to predict. What you don't know anything about is hard to predict. Right? So this can either be uh, the data that you might get in the future, right? Uh, that is hard to predict. But it also, once you observed a particular range of, of data, it's hard to make predictions outside that range as well. Okay, so that's the point here. Okay, so now this was a simple example using a classical data set, the Beetle data set. Now we can do some real life data analysis. Okay, so what happens in real life? So in real life, we will have multiple predictors usually, right? So think about some data that I have from Hindi. This is eye tracking data. And what we computed here uh, was uh, skipping probability. So the probability of jumping over a word, not looking at it, okay? So never fixating on this word. Now, intuitively, like what we know from eye tracking research and so on is that if a word is simple or short to read, very simple or short, you will tend to skip it more. And if, um, uh, if, um, yeah, let's just stay with that. Okay, so that's word complexity is one reason why you might, uh, which might affect skipping probability. So the, the less complex a word, the more likely you are to skip it. Or differently put, the more complex a word, the less likely you are to skip it. Okay. Similarly, we had a metric for something called storage complexity. So how many uh, upcoming words are you going to predict? approximately right that was some one thing that we could compute right for our particular items so that's called storage complexity and so we expected that the higher the complexity uh, storage complexity so the more the words you have to hold in memory the less willing you would be to skip the current word okay so that was one theory that we were investigating so both word complexity and storage complexity could impact skipping probability so what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a column called skipping probability or something like that, which will have a zero when you didn't skip the word and a one when you skipped the word. Okay, so we got zero one responses now instead of, you know, in the beetle data, if you go back to the beetle data, remember what it looked like we had uh, as dependent variables, we had the number of beetles exposed and the number killed. Notice that I could have actually transformed this into a different format. Okay, so what I could have done this is actually a good exercise for you is to do the following. So, uh, what you do is if you got 59 trials with six successes in this case, what you do is you create a vector with uh, 69 instances of 1.6907 for the same dose, you repeat the same dose and of the 59, this is 59 rows, right? You have sixes, you have six ones, six ones somewhere. It doesn't matter where actually, right? It doesn't matter whether they're the first six or the last six or somewhere interspersed. You have six ones and all the others will be zeros. Okay, so there's another way to write this data frame, right? So in fact, you could take this data frame and transform it into the zero one responses that I'm talking about. So basically, that's just another way to store your data with binary responses, that zero one responses. And for eye tracking data with skipping probabilities, that is the normal way that we store it. We don't store it the way the beetle data is stored. Okay. Where was I? Right. Um, yeah, here we are, right? So skipping probability. So we got zero one responses. And so I load, loaded the data here. And then I've computed uh, using uh, total reading time. What I did was I just looked at total reading time to see if total reading time was zero. If total reading time was zero at a particular word, that means it was never fixated. So that means I'm going to write one skipped, right? Uh, whenever the total reading time is zero. So that's how I created the skipping column. And so now I've got zero one responses here and I've got word complexity as, uh, what is it called? Storage cost, right? Everything else is the same. I've got family equal to binomial. Remember I, earlier I had written something like family equal to binomial 
and then there was this logit inside i think something like this right i'd written earlier when i showed you the original fm1 <coughs> fm1 um, model this is just another way to write it i mean it's a shortcut way to write binomial without specifying the the logit the function still glm function still understands that this is what you mean because that's the default Notice that I don't have any weights anymore. There, remember, for the FM1 model, I had weights equal to the total number of exposures, the total number of beetles involved in each row. That is not relevant anymore because I've got 0, 1 responses here. Okay. Okay. So once I fit this model, what happens is that, again, I get very similar output to what I had with the beetle data, except that I have now the intercept, and I've got two slopes here. One is for word complexity, and one is for uh, storage cost and then I've got all my null and, and null and residual deviant stuff etc etc okay we will get to that later so so I've illustrated now with the skipping data that there's a there's a second way to store your data and to plug it into the GLM function for computing these these things so I could have computed a zero one response called dead let's say and then have those as my predictor and I could set family as beetle no weights anymore right because there's no need for that and then you then you fit this logistic regression so you could do the beetle data as well in this way all right so the binomial this logistic regression model or the the what is it called the the logit link function right that i mentioned uh, when i was showing you the the glm code this comes from a wider class of models and what they have in common is that the the underlying models all have the, come from the same dist family of distributions. So the the binomial distribution and the normal distribution that we have studied, they come from a larger class of distributions called the exponential family. And so other members of this family are the Poisson, the gamma, and the probit distribution, among others, right? And so for each of these exponential family distributions, there's a so-called canonical link function that gives the predicted values right for your fitted model uh, for the linear model that you're fitting okay so in the case of the logit link function the um, i remember that i have the log p over 1 minus p is giving you the calculation for the xt beta right so this is the linear model that we are fitting and the canonical link is this guy here okay. so to show you the full range of possibilities there are different canonical links for different members of the exponential family so there's the binomial and the normal family that you are very used to using you know but other families that you have never used before can be used so if you have count data number of fixations on a word you would want to use the Poisson uh, uh, Poisson distribution right you could fit the reading time you could fit reading time data or reaction time data using the gamma distribution because sometimes it does look like a gamma distribution right and so on so there are different possibilities depending on the type of data that you have and for each of these distributions, there is a canonical link function. The link function that we learned about today is the logit link function. This is called the logit link function. And the inverse of this function is called the logistic. It's very confusing. I get confused about this all the time. Which one is logit? Which one is logistic? Um, the important thing to remember is that this log odds transform is called the logit link and that's what we are using in the linear model the inverse of that is called the logistic function and that's why it's called logistic regression also sometimes okay so don't get confused about that because you'll see both logistic regression and uh, the logit link you know you can see both terms so now you know where that's coming from okay so one so that's the general story about the generalized linear model with the logit link function now one question that arises is, is how do you quantify quality of fit right goodness of fit now the way we quantify that is by using the concept of deviance that we studied in the uh, 
matrix formulation of the linear model. So remember that deviance is defined as two times the difference in the log likelihood between the maximum and the uh, non-maximum model, right? So you've seen this in many different ways, right? You, what I'm talking about right now, you have seen in the context of the likelihood ratio test and in the analysis of variance, okay? So in the generalized linear modeling framework, we have a similar concept, basically the same concept, right? So the the first log likelihood that you're seeing here, oh, my pen has stopped working again. I'm sorry, my battery is kind of funny. So what you're seeing here um, are two log likelihoods. The first one, L, B max semicolon y is the log, li log likelihood of the full model, what they call the saturated model with all the parameters in it, right? So usually what we do is we have all our predictors in the model that's in that situation. In that situation, um, uh, that, that would be the maximal model because uh, we have all the uh, predictors in it and this is sometimes called the saturated model, right? And the other log likelihood, this B uh, semicolon Y, is the log likelihood of the model with, um, um, with only the parameters B, but not all the, all the parameters. So to give you a practical example, if I wanted to know the effect of word complexity, I have skipping probability as my dependent variable. So my, my saturated model, my saturated model would have intercept the slope of uh, like the storage complexity and the slope of word complexity, right? My uh, other model, the non-saturated model, right? So L, so sorry, this is the log likelihood, but the model uh, from which I would compute the log likelihood would have, let's call it non-saturated, right? It would be skipping probability is the dependent variable, beta zero plus beta one storage complexity, but not this term, okay? So I've removed that term from the picture. So this is what helps me decide on whether I get an improvement in the fit or not. So this is literally the likelihood ratio test. If you remember the story, I'm looking at the effect of the presence and absence of one parameter here, okay? So now <clears throat> some technical detail that actually we don't really care about, right? So how do you compute deviance in the binomial case? Deviance is computed by the sum of these d sub i's, where d sub i is defined as this equation here. Now, this equation, I've shown it to you, but I've not told you where, it, how it was derived and how to use it. The reason is we will never compute it by hand. The software will give us the output, so I'm not going to discuss this any further. Okay? This takes us down a road of technical detail that is not interesting, actually. There's no real insight here okay, for us. So the basic idea now will be that we will use this deviance, which will be given to us by the model output. We will use the deviance calculation to decide whether the model fit is good enough or not, right? And so it just happens to be a fact from statistical theory that deviance computed as shown here will have a chi-squared distribution with n minus p degrees of freedom. This should remind you of ANOVA, by the way. Remember that in ANOVA, we calculated all these things. It was all deviance that we were talking about there, even though I didn't, may not have used the word there, or maybe I did actually, right? So now deviance will have a chi-square distribution with n minus p degrees of freedom. Uh, n is the number of data points and p is the number of parameters, right? So we'll be using the chi-square distribution with n minus p degrees of freedom, right? So chi-squared n minus p as our reference distribution for deciding whether the model fit is good enough or not. So I'll show you how to do that. We will be also using uh, deviance to do hypothesis testing. So let's just take a look at that. So the difference um, uh, between two models in the deviance is going to be called residual deviance. Okay, you'll see that in the output. And this difference in the deviance will also have a chi-square distribution, but the degrees of freedom will be the difference in the number of parameters between the two models that you're comparing. Okay, so this is, the, this is just like ANOVA. In fact, this is ANOVA, 
I'm just showing you ANOVA all over again now. Okay. So, <coughs> so what I will do is I will fit two models with P and Q degrees of freedom. So an example is this one here. Okay. So I have three degrees of freedom here and two degrees of freedom here. If I'm just thinking of these parameters, so the difference in the degrees of freedom is one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the difference in the deviance against the reference distribution of chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom, the difference in the number of parameters. That's how a hypothesis testing will be done. So we'll be using the deviance not only for checking the quality of the model fit, but also checking, uh, doing hypothesis testing. Okay. So coming back to our beetle data, so let's say we fit this model proportional dead against those using the old method that I'd shown you with the weights and the proportion of dead. Okay. So we computed the, the fit the model, right? The summary output is going to show you, um, show you some deviances here, right? So let's look at those deviances, right? There's two deviances that were shown, right? So the null deviance and the residual deviance, right? We are, so let's find out what this is. The null deviance is telling you, um, uh, so now let's see how what have I done here I'm jumping ahead a little bit right so right 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 so to give you an intuition for the null deviance the null deviance is telling you the deviance of the model when you just have the intercept in the in your model so remember the model that we fit was um, this one we got proportion dead proportion dead as a function of the intercept and slope times those right that's the model the null deviance uh, output here is telling you the um, the the total deviance that you're going to have if you ignore this part of the model okay that's why it's called null right so um, remember that when we fit the model, we estimated our beta 0, beta 1 parameters. We could take the dose vector and compute the, um, the estimated log odds of death. And then we could use our, uh, invert the transformation that I had computed earlier to calculate the proportion of death. So what that does is it allows us to cal to plot the proportion of death as a function of, uh, uh, no, sorry. So it allows us to actually uh, see what the predicted proportion of death, death uh, mu hat, how that relates to the observed proportion of death. So on the x axis, I have the observed proportion of death, right? And on the y axis, I have the predicted proportion of death. And if I plot the, these two against each other, I see that there's basically a straight line. So this is a way of evaluating that your model fit is pretty good here. Okay, this is a graphical summary of, of evaluating the deviation between your observed proportion of death and the predicted proportion of death, right? So this is what deviance is giving you, quantifying for you. It's quantifying this deviance between the observed and predicted values, okay? So coming back to the what the null deviance and the residual deviance give us, okay? So the null deviance is going to give us the equivalent of fitting this, the deviance that you will get when you fit this null model with only the intercept. Okay. So that's what the null deviance is printing out for you. Right. So that's this part here. So <clears throat> the, if you want to plot the model with only the intercept, what will happen is that uh, if you look at the effect of log concentration on proportion of death, and you plot the proportion uh, dead based on the intercept, the intercept is a constant, right? That's why you're getting a flat line here, right? So this is obviously not a good model. You can see that graphically, the deviance is going to be very high between the predicted value and the observed value. You can see the deviance now. It's getting bigger and bigger, right? This deviance. So this is the, this is a graphical summary that gives you an intuition for what a bad, like um, a bad model fit would look like. Whenever you have a bad model fit, you will have a high deviance, deviation between the observed and fitted values, right? All right. So 
Now, when we add the term for dose and compute the deviance, uh, uh, in this case, what we'll find is that what the model prints out for you is that the residual deviance is 11 now. Earlier it was 284. And notice that the degrees of freedom has gone down by 1. That's because you fit one extra parameter. Okay. And so when we plot the predicted values from this full model against the observed data, we see a much smaller deviance between the observed and fitted values. So obviously deviance has improved, right? And so the change in deviance from the null model Uh, sorry, I've written something wrong here. Right, right. Sorry, no, this is correct. So the change in deviance uh, between the null model and the full model is the difference between the null deviance and the residual deviance. That's 273. Okay. So it's one thing that's very confusing about this GLM output is that they, they have the null deviance and then they write the residual deviance. Residual sounds like something that's left out afterwards but the residual deviance is actually referring to the deviance of the full model so the difference in the deviance between the two is the difference between the null and the residual deviance this is very confusing i'm very sorry about that but i didn't design this software i don't know why they did that they must have some good reason for it but i just don't know it and the difference between in in the number of parameters between these two models is one therefore the degrees of freedom is one so my uh, reference distribution is the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. Now if you remember in the past I showed you that 3.84 or whatever is the critical cutoff point for the chi-square distribution. 5% of the area under the curve lies to the right of 3.84 and so um, the so because we have the difference in the deviance is much larger than 3.84 we can reject the null hypothesis that dose has no effect. That means we can reject the null hypothesis that beta 1 is 0. So this is the hypothesis test you will do. The way you do the hypothesis test is you compute the null deviance, the residual deviance, take the difference of those two, figure out what your difference in the degrees of freedom is. This gives you the reference chi-square distribution that you should look at. Find the critical value of the reference chi-square distribution for those degrees of freedom and then check if the difference in the uh, deviances is larger than the chi-squared value for the you know uh, reference distribution. So now you can do all this using the ANOVA function because really if you remember the, what we are actually doing here is the ANOVA. This is all the same thing over and over again. right? So the ANOVA uh, function uh, takes as input the null model and the full model that I had just fit earlier in the previous slide. So it shows you the two models here and it prints out for you, prints out for you the difference in the degrees of freedom and the difference in the deviances. Now it is your job to figure out whether this, dif this difference in deviances is significant or not for this uh, difference in per uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, That step is not done for you by this ANOVA function. I don't know why not. but it's not okay so now it turns out that I mean this is a little bit uh, too much work here because we fit two models and then we did the ANOVA actually it turns out that even if you took the full model and fit an ANOVA on that what it does is it prints out the deviance for the null model and it prints out the deviance for the full model and it tells you the difference in the degrees of freedom so now you can calculate the difference between these two numbers which should be 273 right and compare this 273 to the critical chi squared value oh, sorry this is wrong chi squared value for one degrees of freedom which is 3.84 and because this number is much bigger than 3.84 what that means is that in the reference distribution the observed difference in deviances is far beyond the critical rejection line here right so we can reject the null hypothesis that dose has no effect that's the point here okay so you can also use the the deviance to figure out whether the model fit is adequate or not so remember the graphically i showed you uh, 
that uh, that model fit is highly inadequate here. So let me erase all this. In the null model, the model fit is totally inadequate, right? The null model, in the null model, the the model fit is inadequate because of this large deviance between the observed and fitted values. You can quantify this, you know. I'll show you how to do this. And in the full model with the dose, you see that the deviances are very small, so the model fit is actually pretty good. So, given a model, right? So I'm not doing hypothesis testing now. Given a model, how do I decide whether um, um, whether I have a good fit or not? So, what we do is we calculate for a given model with given degrees of freedom, right? We calculate the deviance of that model, and that deviance, as I mentioned, is going to have a chi-squared distribution with v degrees of freedom, where v is the number of degrees of freedom in the data set in the particular model you fit. Okay. So in the null model that I had fit, which had a very high deviation between the observed and fitted values, I just showed you that picture, right? So there, uh, the null model's deviance, I can use the deviance function to produce this. this. is the first time I'm using the deviance function. I get the deviance from the null model, and now I can compare it against a chi-square distribution with 7 degrees of freedom. Why 7? Why are there 7 degrees of freedom here? In the, um, if you look at the output of the null model, here, right? In the output of the null model, it's showing you what the degrees of freedom are over there. It's going to be the number of data points minus 1, okay? Because there's only one parameter being estimated. All right, so that's where I'm getting the 7 from. And the critical rejection point is 14 here, right? Now, my observed deviance in the null model is much larger than 14. What that tells me is that the model fit is inadequate. For a model fit to be adequate, for my reference distribution's cutoff point, my deviance needs to fall inside the um, acceptance region. Okay, Remember that this area is about 5% of the area under the curve, and this is the so-called acceptance region. right? So my observed deviance needs to actually land inside the acceptance region for the reference chi-square distribution for me to Consider the fit to be good enough. Okay, that's how the goodness of fit is evaluated. Now consider what happens when you have got a good model. So that is the model with dose as a predictor. If you remember, the model had a very good match to the observed data, the predicted values. The deviance now from this model is just 11.232, and this model happens to have six degrees of freedom. So that's why I have six here as my reference chi-square distribution. So the reference cutoff point in a chi-square distribution with 6 degrees of freedom is this number 12 and my observed deviance actually falls inside the acceptance region and therefore I will conclude that my full model, my saturated model is actually a reasonable model, has a good fit. That's how I decide on that. Okay. So that's the whole story about generalized linear models and the good news now is that now that you know the basic generalized linear model and you know the linear mixed model, you can put these two guys together and you can have the generalized linear model, linear mixed model, sorry, with all the variance components and everything fit in here. So because I was lazy, I only fit variance, uh, varying intercepts for subjects and items, but I will uh, make you fit more complex models in a homework assignment. So I'm going to use the GLMER function so the generalized linear mixed model function with family binomial, just like in the GLM function, right? With skipping probability as the dependent variable, this is a 0, 1 response, and word complexity and uh, storage cost as my predictor. So this is my fitted model. And now I can work with this fitted model in the usual way, the way that you have learned with linear mixed models. Except that right now you're working in log odd space. Just remember that you would need to transform back to the proportions uh, to probability scale if you want to interpret the the coefficients that you're getting here in log odd space okay all right so so what's going on here let's take a look so when i look at this model what this prints out for me is the two variance components standard deviations the intercept 
uh, adjustment for subjects and for items, the standard deviation estimates of those. And um, it also prints out the beta 0, beta 1, beta 2 estimates with their standard errors and does some t-tests for me and so on or, z or whatever. Right, so I'm not really interested in those statistical tests right now, but um, right. What I wanted to remind you is that centering the predictors is always a good idea, right? We have discussed this before, so that's what I've done now. Instead of fitting this model with uncentered predictors, these are uncentered, I'm going to center them using the scale, scale equal to false function, right? So now with the centered predictors, I get my fitted model and um, it's basically the results are not going to change. You can't see them because it kind of fell off the screen. Yeah, no, you can see this now, I think, right? And so all that is going to change is that the intercept is going to change, right? It's become minus one point something. Earlier it was minus point, uh, 0.14. But if you look at the slopes, it's the slope for word complexity is minus 0.68 and the slope for word complexity is minus 0.68 here also in the centered model for the uncentered model the slope for for what was it storage complexity was minus 0.53 and so what do i have here minus 0.53 the slopes don't change the slope estimates don't change but the intercepts interpretation now changes okay so i hope you remember all that okay so if I want to now know, if I want to do a hypothesis test to know whether there's an effect of word complexity, what I'll do is I'll fit a null model without that one parameter in the model. So I've removed word complexity from the model and I only have uh, storage complexity centered in the model right now. That's my null model. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to compare the null model just in the usual way with the full model and what that gives me is a uh, likelihood ratio test, a chi-squared test, right, with one degree of freedom. Why one degree of freedom? Because I have only one parameter less now in the null model. And this is now my hypothesis test for determining whether there's an effect of word complexity. So I would write in the paper that there was an effect of word complexity where the chi-squared statistic was, what is it, 1941. I'm getting it here with a p-value of essentially 0, okay? So this number is very small, so I'll just say 0 0.01 or something, less than 0 0.01, right? So this likelihood ratio test gives me the statistic that I will report in the paper when doing a model comparison to evaluate the effect of word complexity. If I wanted to evaluate the effect of storage cost, how would I do that? Okay, that will be a homework assignment. Okay, so that's the whole story that we need to know for the generalized linear model and the generalized linear mixed model with the binomial link function.